What's up, everybody? Uh, welcome to today's panel, Truth in Nonfiction, here for day two of the Terrible Fest. My name is Ben Lyons. I'll be the moderator. I am a host, content creator, producer. Uh, I'm a voter, and I'm at the intersection of sports, culture, and media, and I'm excited today for our panel. We got some really talented folks who are going to be sharing insights about their careers and their journeys and their thoughts on truth in nonfiction. Uh, also, some of the best shooters in my life, and we'll get to that uh, uh, a little bit later. But first, I want to remind you that Cerebral Fest is the premier annual indie TV and web series festival in the United States. It's the home for new digital creative talent, people who are about to take over the TV industry. We honor this year's best content. We provide a space for the next generation of creators like yourselves to connect with industry executives, also like yourselves, to grow your guys' networks, learn new skills, build community. Today, we are talking about how nonfiction filmmakers make compelling content while balancing issues of access and agenda. I know a lot of us were enamored this spring by do the documentary, The Last Dance, the 10 part series that ESPN and Netflix put out. And um, they made it clear that having uh, access to one of the world's most intriguing athletes will provide ample opportunity for compelling uh, stories to come to come to the fold. And we'll break down not only that film, but also how it changed the business of sports storytelling as well. Um, we'd like to thank our, our great festival sponsors, as always, including Dell Technologies, AMC Networks, Shutterstock, and Adorama. Uh, this panel is supported by Writer Duet, a real-time collaborative, pers uh, professional, ridiculously fun, and easy to use screenwriting software for creators. Now, if this is your first event with us this week, welcome. Thank you for spending some, some time with us, and we hope you enjoy the next hour or so. I'm going to show you a little bit on how to use the interface here. You can click the TV icon on the left side of your screen to open up the virtual screening room. You can watch any of the shows. You can click uh, on anyone in the audience to start a private chat with them. We won't hear you on the stage, so I guess if you want to talk about us while we're talking to you, you can do that. Um, we also uh, have on the bottom right toolbar, uh, you'll see the lock icon when it's unlocked. Um, you can ask questions in the, in the chat room. We're going to get to those at uh, the bottom half of the hour, probably around with like 15, 20 minutes to go in the conversation. And we're going to be taking your questions and comments. So please, please um, just uh, raise your hand and, and, and get on in there and, and mix it up with us. Um, all right, time now to bring uh, our dynamic speakers to the group. Uh, I'm going to kick things off with Sarah Gibson, who is an incredible filmmaker, a producer, a uh, storyteller. She's done 10 social justice documentary films, including three films in competition over the years at one of my favorite places on earth, the Sundance Film Festival. Those were Fed Up, IOU, uh, IOUSA, and Small Town Gay Bar. Other titles she's worked on over the years include LA 92, The China Hustle, What Haunts Us. In 2019, she premiered the HBO documentary At the Heart of Gold. Um, and she is directing her first series for Quibi coming up uh, in partnership with Lena Dunham. So we'll get into that as well. So please welcome Sarah Gibson. It's nice to see you. Thanks, Sarah, for taking some time. Um, also on the panel is one half of the knuckleheads. He was drafted out of the University of DePaul, Chicago's own, the 18th overall pick in the 2000 NBA draft. He finished his 13-year NBA career with the New York Knicks, the world's most famous arena. That's right. And now, after a successful year lighting up the league, he's uh, as a successful career lighting up the league, he's transitioned into the world of media. I connected with Quentin Richardson at NBA TV. He's the host of The Bounce in partnership with Yahoo Sports. And of course, you can listen to his podcast with Darius Miles for the Players Tribune uh, called The Knuckleheads. It's a great listen. It's great to have him here on the panel. It's terrible. What up, Q? What's Thank up, man? Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. 
the fact I know you is ridiculous. Um, all right, let's get to uh, our last uh, guest and, and not least, someone I've known actually since I was six years old and until I met Quentin was the best shooter in my life. Sean Carey is an independent producer, a storyteller. His background comes, of course, from CAA and the Agent Trainee Program. Left CAA to work with AOL and was able to be a part of so many different projects, including, I mean, I'll go down the list, man. There's so many um, stuff with Derek Jeter and, and LeBron James and stuff with Inked and Tattoo Stories. And what else did you work on at AOL, Sean? I lost track. Yeah, we worked with Mandalay Sports Media. We did uh, Heidi Klum stuff, Nicole Ritchie, Trebekah Film. Christina I told you, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of famous people. I forgot all yeah. their names, so I got all those. But then Sean went out on his own in 2014. He was executive producer of a film called Red Army, and that changed everything. Red Army is the story of how the Russian hockey program, the most dominant sports team of all time, sort of used to champion the, the message behind the Soviet Union and their fight against the West in, in the Cold War, and then how these players defected to the NHL and went on to win Stanley Cups with the Detroit Red Wings, and it's an amazing story. I went to the Cannes Film Festival and was acquired by Sony Classics, which is such an unusual path for a sports documentary. It really opened up Sean and, and myself, quite frankly, to this idea of sports cinema and these stories that transcend sports and appeal to non-sports fans that have uh, awards potential, but also are appealing to mass audiences uh, as well and, and pop culture. So Sean went on to distribute with our company Rebel Code in search of greatness, which profiles some of the greatest athletes of all time. And now we've got a whole slate of projects uh, across scripted and, and, and of course in nonfiction as well, which we'll get into. So Sean Carey, the greatest shooter I ever met until wow. Ken Richardson. It's great to have you on the panel. Cool. Thanks for having me. Um, Sarah, I want to get uh, started with you, uh, if you don't mind, and sort of just ask you, I know every project you work on is different and how it comes to fruition, but the idea of idea versus access, what comes first and at what point do you have to marry the two? That's a really incredible question, and it's one I encounter every single day at, in my job. I'm producing two films right now, one that has, uh, well, actually both have a ton of archives, so usually when... Um, a project comes to me or I, I think of a project, I'm always looking for one of two things, either access to uh, interview subjects or access to archive. Um, and archive is, you know, one of those things that uh, I have a passion for. I love like, no, like nothing more than to spend an entire day on C-SPAN. It's like painful for most people. But um, that's something that's like a hobby, you know. Um, so, so archive is, uh, is really, you know, for me is king. Like I love finding, you know, especially with LA 92, the amount of archive that we found from independent shooters. Um, so I would say one of those two things, it has to have either you know, great characters and interview subjects or archive. Speaking of archive, as we were getting loaded up here. Uh, on the uh, on the the shindig for our conversation, Quentin was digging in his archives, and he was showing us old photos of when he first got drafted to the Clippers, doing these photo shoots with his teammates and stuff. And Quentin, you got in the league in 2000 when the NBA as a media company, this is post Michael Jordan, it was humming. You guys were getting documented every step of your lives were really you know for the whole world to see. Now, 20 years later, as you're a storyteller yourself. How have you gone back into those archives and sort of thought about how to craft stories around some of that stuff that Sarah's talking about, those original materials? Yeah, man, it's interesting. Like you say, how you can go back 20 years and, and, and people still find relevance in some of that stuff. So for us, man, especially with uh, with our podcast, that's that's what that's what we've come to find out that, that the average fan and people want to know. They want to know all of those funny off-kilter stories that, that don't you know, that ESPN don't know the acts or the, or the interviewees don't know the acts. And we're privileged to a lot of them because we were, A, involved in a lot of them, and B, in the league, it's a fraternity. So if you're not really involved, you you hear about a lot of things one way or the other. So for us, we just felt like the ones that are fun and, and that are, that are you know, you know uh, proper for the scenario, I, I should say, you know, those are the ones that we try to bring to light. And I find that people have a lot of fun with them. Well, you have great access, obviously, because you have great relationships with guys you either played with, played against, admire. You had George Gervin coming up, I think, on the pod. You know, somebody's you great access to talent. Sean, as an independent producer, some of the sports films you've worked on over the years, certain ones you have more access to talent than others. 
How does that sort of play into the overall production strategy, you know, when you're telling a sports story? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah. you know, I mean, if, if you can find, you know, the project, you know, sometimes you find access to the people surrounding the story, right? If it's somebody who's passed away and you, but you find these people that are really intimate with them and they can, you know, share these emotional journeys with their own life experiences. And sometimes they're much better storytellers than uh, the athletes themselves. And, you know, finding those people that can kind of, you know, bring to life, you know, what that person's kind of spirit was or, you know, what their energy represented. Um, you can want to, you know, sometimes it's a family member, sometimes it's a close friend, it's a girlfriend, it's a coach, you know, it's those people in their life that kind of, you know, understood them maybe even better than they understood themselves. And so if you can tap into that, that sometimes brings it to life. And then again, yeah, you know, I've, I've struggled with the archival stuff, especially with older stories where you're like, oh shit, it's from 1950s or 60s. Like, how do we go find this stuff? Is it going to be good material? But you'll be surprised. There's so much out there. And if you find the right, you know, I'm curious what Sarah thinks about this. She's gone you know, down the rabbit hole, but like finding the right research, you know, people and, and discovering that stuff, it'll, it'll blow your mind how much is out there from like many, many decades ago that can help tell the story. Yeah, Sarah, I would imagine over the years and putting together some of your projects, uh, you've gone to no stone left unturned to uh, to find a photo or a, or a piece of footage that kind of brings it all together. Um, what, what's sort of the strangest place you've had to go to find something? <laughs> um, well, so a couple, like three or four films ago, I made a film called What Haunts Us. And it was about a story at a high school in Charleston, South Carolina in the 1980s. And a lot of these smaller market uh, stations, news stations, don't have the budgets to properly archive all of their tapes and all of their, their files. And they don't have the staff, they don't have the budgets, they don't have the storage space. Um, and so a lot of these smaller sort of markets that have these incredible stories that you know didn't make the national news, it didn't make, you know, like CBS or ABC. Um, so how are you gonna, you know, find that archive? So um, literally for like six months, I, I was trying so hard to get any news coverage of this, this thing that happened in this town and they buried it and it was something they wanted to forget about. And literally I was in, I was in Charleston driving down the street and I saw like a TV crew, right? Cause they, they, they hadn't been answering my, my emails or phone calls for like six months. And it was getting to the point where I was desperate, like absolutely desperate. Like I was going to break into this news station, you know? And uh, I see this news crew and I pull over and I like run across the street and I, I basically said, can you help me? Like, I will, I, will, I will pay you cash if you will go into this archive and like get these tapes. And the woman like took me up on it. She was like, how much? <laughs> and I said, I said, five grand. And she said, done. And within two days, she found, she'd gone into the storage space, dug up these tapes from the early 1980s made dubs of them because they're on like, you know, beta, beta and three quarter tapes um, and sent me, sent me the footage. I sent her five grand and she was happy and I was happy. So you really have to, you know, like literally think outside the box. Like I always say, grease the wheels. I'm, I'm not saying bribe anybody, but I'm saying incentivize people to help you is what I'm saying. It's no, worth it. It's, it's so true. And, and it goes to show you just what, to speak to your talents as a filmmaker, again, no stone on turd to be, to be so resourceful and to go out there and just like make it happen. You got to do it. And it's so different than say like the last dance, which I mentioned in the intro, when their problem was like, we have so much footage. We have all the footage. How do we comb through it? As opposed to you're trying to find that footage. Quentin, as someone who grew up in Chicago, loving Mike, signed your entire career to his sneaker company, which is incredible. Yes. Talking right about seeing right all that footage for the first time, that unseen stuff, as a fan, just that access to it, what it did for you emotionally. Man, for me, I was blown away. Like, I I thought I had seen everything that you could see on Mike. I've, I've scoured the internet for every highlight, everything. I didn't think, I'm like, it's just even before it came out, they were like, oh, this unseen footage. I still was going into it like... Man, it'll be a couple new things, but I've seen everything. I literally sat at home and watched WGN and watched everything. So for me to see a lot of those different uh, instances, and the best part for me was to get his insight. I think to get his voice and his uh, his perspective on it 
was was amazing. I think that was what made it the most amazing about it to get his perspective and his explanations on some of the things that that I had questions about from his career and from the past. And I think they did an incredible job of putting it the way they put it together and had his voice in it. I love that part of it. Yeah, Qu Quentin's love for Michael Jordan is kind of, I think of like a Harry Potter fan opening weekend, dressing up in like the whole costume <laughs> to go to the theater. I feel like you were sitting there on the couch, fully dressed up. That was the 85 warm up I had on and I had the the the, 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 the retro ones, the first one. <laughs> and I was, I, was, I was in character, I was ready to go. I had the Lou Malnati Chicago deep dish pizza. It was, it was a mood over here. It was a vibe. <laughs> I love, I love it, man. You're such a fan still after all these years. And, and you know, Sean, in some of, in some of your projects, you, you, you've been able to have great footage and great access to stuff, great access to players, great access to people's families. Um, but we switch gears from archival stuff to real time access and having to either sit with someone and you only get two hours and you know that's your movie or you have two months or three months. How do you know not to overshoot them? Walk me through the balance of access to something that's happening in real time as opposed to this archival footage we were talking about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, if you're trying to, you know, I guess it depends, right? Like if you're, if you're getting full-time access, but you want to live with them through a moment, right? Like you want to be with them where they're, you know, there's events happening there's life in their life. So there's a story going to happen. It's going to be good, bad, or, you know, there's going to be some kind of event, right? Like you're, you're, you're with them and you're seeing them kind of, you know, make decisions and and decide as they lead up to something and go through something that might be maybe transformational or maybe, you know, kind of routine, right? Like, and, and both of those could be compelling in their own right. So that idea of like, can you, you know, a lot of, you know, you see these sit down interview opportunities and that was what Last Dance was. I mean, it was, it was amazing what Q is talking about just to hear insight on history is cool. And I think if you have older athletes, that's probably more interesting. Right. Or, you know, older characters, you're doing a look back. If you've got like someone, you know, younger and you're trying to, you know, see what their life is like, you know, day to day, you look at Tom versus time and Tom Brady and kind of living with him or Steph Curry. Um, you know, what are they doing as, you know, Hall of Famers in action? That's kind of compelling to see what is the day to day life of these guys trying to achieve excellence on a routine basis. Like you're like, oh, like what do they do in the morning? How do they get up? What are like the basic things? Those are interesting components to like document a character. So I think it just depends on what stage in their life they're at, you know, if you want to kind of be a part of some journey they're going through in real time or, you know, it's probably just valuable. Hey, like, let's get this person talking. They've lived a Hall of Fame life. They can talk about so many different aspects and stories. Let's just get them to open up and feel intimate with me. And, you know, let's give Michael Jordan, you know, a bottle of scotch and see what happens. <laughs> Uh, Mike's on that tequila. We all know that. Mike, come on. Is that tequila? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Brown liquor. I don't know. Uh, but but look, that there's a comfort level that clearly was established between him and the filmmaker, either in that moment or over the weeks leading up to it. So Sarah, maybe I'd ask you the idea of how do you kind of, what do you do off camera to get a subject matter comfortable so they give you what you need on camera? Oh, wow. That got a little jarbled for me. Could you say that again? Sorry. No, 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 no. We were just talking the idea of comfort level and, you know, we're, the, 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 the idea of this panel is, is access and truth and nonfiction. So it's the idea of how, what do you do off camera to maybe make somebody let their guard down, feel comfortable, mm -hmm. so they're able to give you what you need on camera, knowing your time with them might be limited and they might have some reservations about giving, giving what you need. Yeah, so I'm a I'm a big person even during COVID, and I'm, I've been doing it lately of of going and and seeing people in person. Um, I think that you know communication over the phone and over Zoom gets you so far, but especially when you're telling really difficult stories, um, the gesture of of getting on a plane, getting in your car, going out of your way to make someone feel like they matter and they're important to you, but you're not just chasing the story because you want to make a film and and sort of um, sort of hate to say use them for you know to make a film but like for me like I always have to go and meet with people in person it's like even when I'm not directing the film as the producer I feel like developing that trust and also for people to hear why you're doing it for me all of my films have a social justice angle to them and for me it's how I sort of deal with um, my own like rage about the world. And so when I sit down with someone who's had an injustice happen or something gone sideways in their life, 
to sit with them and tell them about why their story matters to me and how them speaking out can create change and enlightenment and, and shine a spotlight um, and help others. Uh, that's something that means a lot to people. And so, um, you know, I have a lot of luck with that. And it, it's not easy. It's often inconvenient. It's often exhausting. Uh, I've had to spend days of my life with people that literally I feel like I'm, you know, crawling out of the meeting on my hands and knees, exhausted and, and crying or whatever. But it absolutely is worth it. And they feel like they feel safe if, if you make them feel like they matter to you. And that's how you how you get them to open up. And that's how you get them to share all of their, their stories when they normally wouldn't and give you footage and give you photos. And it's a real relationship. I, I'm still in touch with some of the, the gay people in the South uh, that I've made my first documentary with. Um, and it, it has been, you know, a, a, a beautiful gift in my life to stay in touch with them and hear what they're doing and how, you know, how their lives have turned out 20 years later. So... Well, I was going to follow up and ask, clearly, you know, they trust you, but then there's got to be part of you that holds that trust rather sacred. And, you know, you might have to show something or expose something about them that might not present them in the best light. But if that's what the story calls for, even after earning that trust, how do you wrestle with kind of removing your emotions or your personal connections to these subject matters you're documenting? That's a really good question. Um, certainly there's been some villains in my films and I always just try and, and strive for an authentic, truthful portrayal of them without manipulating the interview or the audience or the edit. And I've had a lot, lot of luck with that, even with really painful uh, interviews. Um, even, even when someone isn't painted in the most positive light, they feel like at least it was truthful and that they appreciated that we didn't manipulate the edit. Um, it's it's tough. It's really, really tough. Like there's some people that I've gotten really, you know, nasty notes from. Um, and, you know, uh, they try and sue you. <laughs> and uh, it's nerve wracking. But it's, you know, if you're doing it for the right reasons, it's absolutely worth it. It's it's exhausting, though, when, when someone tries to sue you. <laughs> like happens a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 Q, I mean, in, in your previous life as a player, it kind of makes me think of your relationship with certain members of the media, the beat writers who are covering the team, the bloggers, the radio hosts. How are you able to navigate that part of your life and establish trust in telling your story with those storytellers? Uh, I think for me, myself and Darius, I think that's the beautiful, beautiful part about us when we walk into the room well obviously before we even get to the room we make that when we reach out and make that connection and ask them to be on the show uh i think they know but we also reinforce that, that, that we're a player before we anything we aren't uh the typical media type or whatever you would call it i don't you know no disrespect to the to the typical media people yeah no. everybody what do you say about typical media people over here dude what are you <laughs> but, talking about they they know that we've we've done the same things they've done. We've ran the same sprints, we rode on the same buses, sat in those same locker rooms, and we've all been through the same things. And we've we've been on the other side of it where we've had the microphone stuck in our face, or we've sat there and done an interview with somebody, and then when you go back and you see the interview, it's not the way it, that you wanted it to be, or some things are, are kind of twisted in different ways that, that turn your story around. So we re we reinforce from the beginning, like yo. We here to have a good time, man. This is this is you coming into our world, and we're about to kick it and hang out, and this is about to be fun. Anytime during the, during the interview, something we ask something you don't like, you you give us the wave off, it, and it's cool. If you say something that you didn't like, or something comes out the way you didn't want it to come out, you can say, "Hey, let me go back and and do that over again," because we want you to feel as good about this interview as we do. We want when you hear it to tell your friends and tell this person, because that's how we were. When we were in the league and we were getting interviewed, the interview, the times when we get we we read it and it was the way we we said it when we did it and it was it felt good. Like we we proud of that. We like, yo, go check out this article that they did on me here because it cause you feel good. I've had articles in some of the biggest publications and they didn't come out the way that I really wanted it. So I didn't really like it. It didn't really matter to publication. It's just because it, it wasn't my true voice. So we always try to give each of our guests their true voice and make sure that we we having you on here to show you love because we loved your game and the way you play. So you have no fear of anything. We're not trying to attack in any way. No clickbait, anything like that here. This is all love. And, and at the end of the day, 
we players too. So, you know, these are our peers and this is a big fraternity we're in and we would never disrespect it. No, it, it's a it's a great listen. And anybody out there who loves basketball obviously gravitates towards it. But, you know, the men and women you have on the show are able to share light life lessons and things about their journeys off the court that I think, um, you know, is a testament to that comfortable setting that you guys establish. Um you know, the podcast medium is perfect for that. You have a lot of time with them. You know, it's over 45 minutes or an hour. You can really kind of chop it up and get into it. Sean, when you're coming up with ideas for, a, let's say, a different nonfiction project, do you, how do you cater the, the home with the, the creative? You know, if you have an idea, do you kind of shape it or change it at all with where it might end up? Um, for anybody who's watching who has an idea for a documentary themselves, is that something they should be aware of and how to get that story out there of how the creative is impacted for, you know, by the home of the, of the film? Um, when, you, when you say like the home of the film, do you mean like a target network or like your, what do you mean by the home? Well, like the idea that, okay, you have an idea for a story. Maybe it's a film. Maybe it's a TV show. Maybe it's yeah. a Quibi series. Maybe it's a thing. How does the sort of the platform dictate the creative and on that journey? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's got to be the idea first. You know, I mean, if you're passionate about the idea, it's going to have so many ups and downs and people are going to, you know, give you feedback on how you might want to shape it or potentially compromise it. But if you've got kind of the core of what story you're trying to tell or the character and you believe in that, and I think, you know, it's got to have, I think, layers to it, right? I think people respond to things that are multidimensional. And I think, You've got to kind of realize if it's something that you think kind of has an opportunity to reach a specific audience, but then maybe transcend, that's kind of the goal. And, it, and if you can tell something that you're really passionate about in terms of like, you know, finding it, its home, I think it's going to probably, you know, you'll get a, a quick response, I guess, from the marketplace. Like, you know, if you're putting it out there in the, in the best way possible, uh, it'll find its home. You know, I think there's so many buyers out there and if you've got something that, you know, is compelling to a, you know, a passionate enough audience and then maybe, you know, a broader audience, I think you got to let's lean into your your own personal connection to the story and why you believe in it. I don't think you can really look at the marketplace and try to create for the marketplace. I think you got to figure out, hey, this is something that, you know, I was looking at like, I'm the consumer. I want to watch this. Is this something that I believe in and would want to watch and I think is really important to me and has entertainment value? And then you kind of build it and build your team and build the creative. And then I think, you know, the home will find itself or, you know, potentially you don't find a home, but at least you did it, I think, the right way. I don't think trying to customize things for, you know, what's trending or the marketplace is going to lead you to a whole lot of success. Yeah, I want to use this opportunity to transition to that sort of the next phase of a film's journey, Sarah, and that's the distribution phase. I mentioned you had a bunch of films go to Sundance. You've worked with partners from television places to, you know, obviously traditional film distribution companies put out your film, all different types of partners. For documentary filmmakers out there, it's oftentimes sort of a forgotten part of it. You're fighting so hard to get the money for production or you're fighting so hard to actually make it. That third piece of getting it out there, getting it seen. What have you sort of taken from the 10 social justice films you've worked on in terms of the sales process and finding a perfect home for your stories? Oh, that's such a great question. And it's every project is different, you know, um, because the topics that I've worked on have been so wide, widespread. Um, from climate change to the economy to, you know, sexual assault to uh, race, um, you know, cults, uh, music. Um, so it really is about, you know, I think the getting the right partner, like, that is going to nurture the film's release. Like, you know, recently we, uh, we did the gymnastics film. We raised the money for that independently. And then... We, we came to a place where we thought we need to, you know, start thinking about distribution. And we had, you know, five offers on the film. And ultimately, in the end, we made the decision to not go with the, the highest money offer, but we went with what we felt was the best home that would be, you know, nurtured, where the film would be nurtured. And uh, I think it was the right decision. I think, um, you know, the thing is, is that Netflix gets something like, 500 times more eyeballs than all the other platforms. So certain films really deserve that kind of exposure. Um, like, for example, the film The China Hustle that I did went to, to Netflix worldwide, and that got such a big international response. 
in a way that I think if we put it on a like Showtime or even HBO, we would have gotten like a tenth of the eyeballs. And so, you know, we were able to create more social change. And so it really depends on like what your goals are of the film, right? Like, is it about, uh, you know, an indie college distribution platform? Is it about, you know, a, an international uh, lobbying effort? Um, it, it really, I think that the topic and the distributor have to be a good match. Being a good match, let's switch it, do a 180 and take it to the beginning of a story. Q, you've been talking about you and Darius potentially putting something together about your life or you've, you know, thought about now that your playing days are over, how you go back and tell some of those stories, whether in podcast form or even a step further in a video form. As a creator, as a subject matter, what are you looking for in your partners when producers approach you or directors approach you? What would be an ideal marriage you think in, in finding that great storyteller to bring your ideas to life? Um, like Sarah said, I definitely want them to have the, you know, the imprint and the reach to, you know, the, uh, to really be able to get it out there when we do that. But um, I want it to be a collaborative thing to where we, we both work together on the idea of it, building it out. Cause I'm not sure exactly how we want to do it, but I'm, I'm definitely open to all of the ideas and, and, and things like that. But um, I definitely want it to be somebody who, who, who uh, who knows who we are and what we're about and um and understand what it's a, what this whole culture thing is about and, and, and can kind of take that walk with us and down memory lane and, and partner up with us in that. You know, something I always love about Sean, you guys want to embarrass him a little bit, is that when he goes all in on a project, he's all in. He becomes the expert on it. He reads every book on it. He's all encompassing in every facet of where it pops up in culture. And, and Sean, I've seen you on these pitches and in these calls, you're so well prepared because you really live and breathe and understand the story on like a deep emotional level. When you talk to partners and you convey that, and we have a couple projects with athlete partners, you know, how are you able to sort of lean on that, share that and get them on board with that same passion to then move the, the story forward? Yeah. I and mean, I think it's, I mean, thank you for that. And, and to you talking about like, you know what I mean? Like you got to know, like soulfully, like, you know, connect with people on it and show that like, you're the person to help tell that story, you know, potentially, you know, even as like a fan, right? Like I've been working on this Jerry Tarkanian project forever and cl got close with the family and I've interviewed everyone who knows Jerry Tarkanian. And it's such, you know, there's like five books about him, but like you can take that like research and what you can find. But then when you talk to people and you've got your own kind of knowledge and then you get to like really communicate with people that knew a character and get to know them. And then, you know, you're able to reference that when you're talking to other people and say, hey, I got this from Sonny Vaccaro. I got this, you know, from, you know, Oscar Goodman, the mob lawyer. And like all of a sudden they're like, oh, this guy knows more than I do. And they're a family member. And then they're like, oh, I trust this guy. Like he's literally done his diligence and he cares more than me. So like, sure, like this guy's going to protect his, his story and he's going to do it in an interesting way. And and it is, it is an investment. So Sarah's born, you got to live with these people. You got to like really make them, you're not using them. You're partnering with them. You're bonding with them. And you're becoming kind of like their extended family to tell their story the right way. And that's kind of your goal. And it, and it gives you that unique leverage when you're talking to other partners, you know, from celebrity partners who have a lot more experience than you. They can't go around you because no, you know the story better than anyone else. And you've got the connection to, you know, the roots of the story, the people that are tied to this exclusive IP. So, you know, it gives you an advantage as a producer to make these relationships and it's enjoyable. It's like you get to learn about inspiring, interesting people and, and hear amazing, cool stories. And if you can get in there, it's like, you know, the, the experience is rewarding and it's a journey that like, you know, you, you just kind of enjoy and opens your eyes to, you know, different people you wouldn't have known otherwise. So it's cool. You know, I love that like journalistic aspect of, the storytelling process because it does kind of introduce you to so many characters in the world that you wouldn't maybe normally talk to. Well, I, absolutely. And I was going to say, Sarah, you know, what I love about your pieces is that I feel like they have the best elements of long form, you know, journalistic storytelling or a long form piece you would see from a news outlet. But then you top, top on top of that, you're able to add a, an emotional human element that really connects you as a viewer to the film um, partly obviously great producing, but comes with great directing in the documentary space. So when you have a project, how do you know that that director is the right person for the story that you want to tell? 
Oh my God, that is such, oh, you're asking so many good questions. Um, it's both in the mail, Sarah. I already, you know, you keep saying that every time. I really appreciate it. But yeah, I mean, well, no, there's really no good. window to, to think um, about it. Yeah. It's so, it's so psychological. You know, I always say like a, a, hiring a director for a story is like, it's almost like dating. It's the same with editors, you know, directors and editors and documentary and the producer. It's like you're in a relationship for a really long time and you kind of like, you bond very deeply with these people because it's a very emotional experience. The films that I make are like, they're all in your heart chakra. You're always in your heart every day, you know, like sort of struggling together to get this story made the best it can be. Um, and so it really is kind of like, I guess what it must be like to go to war in some ways, like for me, like that's how it feels. Um, especially making the gymnastics movie was like that. LA 92 was like that. Uh, the China Hustle was like that. A film I'm doing now is like that. Um, so how do you find the best director? I mean, for me, it's all about the emotional sort of connection that the director has. It's not about their intellect as much as it's about their emotional connection. Because for me, the power of documentary is not in sort of the intellectual understanding of ideas, but in the emotional understanding of them, especially with social justice. Because if you can't make the audience feel something, then they, if they understand it, it's one thing. But if they feel it, it's even more powerful. So finding a director who really connects to the topic in their heart. Um, you know, for example, right now, the project I'm doing with Lena Dunham, we, uh, you know, we're developing it with another director and she got another film that took up her schedule and she couldn't do it. And I said, okay, well, we have to find another director. And Lena said, well, you're directing it because you connect with the story in your heart. And she was doing the same thing to me that I do with so many other directors, like kind of talking them into doing these films they don't necessarily want to do. <laughs> and that's what she did to me. <laughs> so now I'm doing this, directing this, this series. And um, and I, I think I'm the right director for it because I, because I connect with the story in my heart. You know, I, I, I relate to it in a way that not a lot of people could. So it's very specific and it's, it's tricky, you know, because sometimes you see a film and you're like, oh, if somebody else had just directed that, it would have been so much better. Well, you talk about that that heart connection and, and the emotion a, a filmmaker has to have for, for their story. I mean, when I think about emotion, I think about investing your heart and soul into your work. I think of professional athletes. You know, when when you go to work every day and it's your 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 life and you're feeding your family and it's your body and it just feels like such a deep emotional connection uh, to to that to your craft. Quentin, did you find throughout your life and your career to you know, show people that you had those same passions or similar passions or emotions away from the game, off the court. LeBron has popularized the more than an athlete movement, but the idea of, as a storyteller, creator, uh, the idea that you can bring more to it simply than just your deep love for basketball. Uh, for me, not not until recently, not until retiring. I can't, I can't say, like, when I was, during my playing time, like, I was focused as far as, like, uh, you know, keep trying to keep finances and things like that off the court. But as far as like, I didn't, I didn't have a lot of businesses. I didn't, you know, my, my era wasn't huge on that. That that's like more of the recent area, last ten years or so. But I was, I was all in. I was tunnel vision. I'm, I'm a hooper. I'm, I'm in the gym. I'm doing what I got to do. I'm taking care of my money. I'm not spending all my money, so I'm cool there. But I'm like, I'm tunnel vision. So then, like the last three or four years. I started to begin to think of that. I took the Sportscaster U program class that they give at the MBPA. Went to Syracuse, did that. Like, okay, I might be a broadcaster or whatever. Try to come get your job. So I did that. But then literally once I, I retired and then I started to work for the Pistons, then my wheels were turning like, okay, like I'm coaching, but is this going to be it? Like what, what else is out there? And that's when I started to do the articles with the Players Tribune. And then all these different opportunities started coming. It was like, okay, well, Turner, you know, I go over there. The Turner was at ESPN a couple times, did some stuff over there. So it was like, okay, if you want to do this, you kind of got to try and go at it. So that was when I came up with the idea to do the podcast and me and Darius got together doing that. So then it was like, now I, I kind of have to look at it that way. Like what are, you know, using those resources and those connections and, and then to be able to, uh, start the podcast and be able to get the people that we were, that we were able to get in the beginning, that let us know that we had a, a real opportunity to do that here. No, it's so cool to hear that evolution and that's, that you know, journey for your story and how your mindset shifted um, in telling stories yourself. And as a result, they're able to get out there now. And 
um, in all these different ways. So I think Sarah's back. We lost her for a second. She hit refresh. She's rejoined the group. Um, but I think we also have some time if there are any questions from anybody out there to hit the wave button and we'll try to, uh, to have you chime in and ask these guys uh, anything you might want to know. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, but I'll, I'll continue because I, I have a few more. Um, one in particular, just the idea of sports storytelling. We've, we've kind of obviously touched on it a little bit, but Sarah, you've done films from, you know, like you said, social injustice to, uh, you know, mental health and suicide and, and sexual abuse, but some of your stories have been rooted in sports. Is there a different type of challenge you face as a filmmaker when telling a story that is rooted in the world of sports and how you get it out there? Mm, that's a great question. Well, the, uh, the last... Do we lose her? Do you guys hear her? Uh, no. It's on mute for me. Uh-oh. I don't know. I see her. What title? Uh, I think think Sarah's going to refresh again. Um, but but Sean, you know you you <laughs> Sean, are you back, sir? Yeah. No, we still don't. Have. All right. While she refreshes, and we get hopefully some questions from anybody watching, Sean, you talk about sports cinema. This idea of finding those sports stories that transcend the genre. You've worked mm -hmm. on a couple of films over the years that aren't rooted in sports. Yeah. But what is it about the sports ones you do gravitate towards that make you think that there is an appeal in the nonfiction space outside of the sports audience? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think about sports is it's kind of like it levels the playing field. It brings all these different types of people together. Right. Like I think about my own athletic career and, and competing in, in high school and, you know, opportunities to meet. <laughs> Open in high school. You can pull it from 25 before people. Yeah. Are, I went to college. Sean, I swear to God. Yeah, I, I, respect, I, I, believe I respect it. Right. I went to college to play, but like it opened my eyes. You know, I, I mean, I'll tell you, like I played in New York City. I played for a team called the Brooklyn Beast, and I was the only white dude on the team, and I was the shooter. But like we went on these road trips, and I was in, you know, hotel rooms with these kids from all different areas of New York City and Brooklyn. But like, I guess the whole team were in the Crips. And like they would tell me what that meant to be in the Crips and like explain it to me in a way they were like, yeah, you're just kind of a part of it, but it's not like I'm doing gang violence and things. And I was like, oh, and like joking, like, can I be in the Crips? And they were like, you know, like, no. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> but it was like that, those kind of like cultural moments where I got to hang out with people and learn about their lives. And it was that, like, obviously I'll look back and like, yeah, I played basketball, but I remember that. Like, I remember those hotel rooms with kids and being on road trips. And I remember like the adversity. I just think sports, you know, it, it highlights people's struggles and it shows people overcoming and kind of becoming a better version of themselves through, you know, the experience in sports, but more in their life. You know, whether it's gaining confidence or, you know, understanding relationships or just understanding adversity. And I think athletes lean into adversity and that idea of, you know, telling stories about adversity, about relationships, it, 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 and connecting people from all walks of life, sports is an entry point for that. And that's a global entry point. It's not just, you know, U.S. projects, right? You look around the world and, and soccer and you know, Formula One, you know, you got people coming and intersecting from all walks of life. And I think that's where it's like a great playing ground for really exciting stories and people, you know, forming relationships that they otherwise wouldn't that are surprising and the true stories around all of that is exciting and then you can obviously you know fictionalize it as well but just that intersection you know i always look at sports stories like if my mom likes it i think it's a win because she doesn't give a shit like she went to cheer me on when she was a kid but like oh it's like it'll appeal to my mom it'll appeal to non-sports fans because it's got heart you know what sarah's talking about it's got it's genuine it's got heart and it's about life and it's about, you know, journeys and it's about not it's life in like in not a sheltered way. Like sports brings people into a broader life. It opens their eyes to a bigger world. than a lot of people I know I grew up with, they don't know any better than the Upper East Side of New York City and finance or, you know, some kind of, you know, basic journey, not to put it down completely. But like they don't they're just completely unexposed because they didn't have a lot of sports experience that might open their door, you know, open their eyes to things. No, it's so true. And, and, and it's amazing, too. Like, for people who know Sean, loves sports, not the biggest hockey fan, executive produced the greatest sports hockey doc of all time. Like, yeah. you know, 
story <laughs> that, that yeah. really made that film transcend and do what it did. But know? the thing about sports that's consistent in that way, right? Like you had this hockey team and you got to see them train 11 months out of the year and become brothers and this journey and how that bonded them for life and, and just what they went through as athletes and dealing with the government and the political social drama and the, you know, like, 1980, like all the elements, but the core of like why, you know, sports stories, I think can connect across the board. It's these athlete journeys and what they sacrifice and how they build character if it's done well, right? Like, and they build confidence and camaraderie, but it like, if it's done right, they become better people. And like, if you can find those examples, they're inspiring across the board. Or the people we got, uh, it could really hurt them. He's back. Um, I think we have some questions. We've got 10 minutes or so left here before uh, the next part of the programming uh, continues here. It's terrible. This one's from Etta Elliott. Is Rebel Code hiring during the quarantine? Um, we <laughs> give you the college credit. We got college credit. Yeah, we're a lot of free internships. <laughs> <laughs> to the premiere and college credit. Uh, Sarah, I'm actually from Charleston wondering what the story was that you were trying. What was the story you are trying to find in Charleston? Oh, wow, that's so interesting. Um, so it was uh, a story at Porter Goud uh, School, which was kind of like the Horace Mann of Charleston um, for New Yorkers. Uh, and it um, was a, uh, a, a coach at the school who abused many kids in Charleston at many schools over like 40 years. Mm -hmm. And he got away with it until he didn't. And um so yeah, so Charleston, they they tried to bury the story, they tried to forget it in their history. Uh, we, you know, unearthed it and reminded them. And uh, it was not pretty. It was not a pretty journey. <laughs> but the we movie was very good. <laughs> we have a uh, another question, uh, I think, uh, if we can have it pop up here. Time for a second question. Are there any anecdotes you can share about how you mishandled that balance between access and accuracy and how you rebounded or the lessons you learned? Thanks, Ajay running the whole show here at Sterable and, and contributing to the Q&A. Um, ideas of access that were, uh, you know, mis, uh, misused or abused. I mean, I was on the set once of Entourage and I gave Johnny Drama the cell phone, didn't tell him he was live on a radio show. He figured that out pretty quickly and was upset. Probably shouldn't have done that. Um, what do you got, Sean? Do you have any, any moments over the years where like access and um, maybe authenticity was something that, you know, you struggle with? I'm thinking about it. I mean, nothing's coming to mind where I like really screwed up the relationship. Um, maybe I, I mean, one time with a journalist got too close, they like, became drinking buddies and that kind of backfired on the professionalism, right? Like you can't just be like, Oh yeah. And like having fun and drinking and texting where it got like, Oh, a little too like camaraderie that ultimately backfired in a way that was like, Oh, you got to keep your boundaries. <laughs> you know, yeah. there's like a, a learning lesson. Be like, you know, they're not, it's it's still professional and you don't, you do need to kind of keep a certain wall of, you know, social professionalism no matter what. I would imagine, Quentin, on, on your end, there were probably some reporters who abused that trust or access that you gave them and then turned their back on you and wrote some story or created some rumor or something. That probably happened a few times. No? Nobody got that access. <laughs> no one got no one got that access. I don't I never I no disrespect, but I never trusted the media like that. I didn't get I didn't have anybody like this is my guy, I'm cool with this guy. Like I, I, I treated everybody the same. I was fair, I was honest, I was straight, I shot straight with them. If I didn't want to talk about what they was asking me, I would say that. I it, it was no tricks in my bag. I wasn't gonna play the game. So I, I was straight up and down like six o'clock. I thought such a Michael Jordan fan, you'd have like you're a Bob Rashad. Like you didn't have your guy who was like your no, personal interviewer. No. Like that's MJ, man. Being that's that's him, that's his airness. He can have his guy. I was just, you know, regular old cute. Somebody didn't even want to be my guy. You know, wants to be my guy. <laughs> I was a little too young. I would have been the Bob Rashad. Um, Sarah, you know, uh, the idea of access and, and how it impacts authenticity in your storytelling is sort of in the theme of this conversation. Have there been moments where you have felt too close, either emotionally or for whatever reason, to a subject matter where you felt like, OK, I'm not actually the one to tell that story anymore because I have so much access? Mm. Yeah, maybe a little bit. Like there's certain things about, you know, characters that you don't want to reveal when you sort of get to know more about them. And then 
you made them kind of the hero of your film, and then you discover all these things about them that are are like, oh God. <laughs> We're just gonna like not look at that because um, you know that the, sometimes, especially when they they have a persona like a public persona, and you're you're ex- you're sort of exploring that in the film, and then you like as Sean said, you hang out with them, you know, uh, you know afterwards, or you see sort of what happens after the film comes out, and you see like you know something ugly in them. Um, they can get it can get really it can get tough, you know. Um, and so there's a certain amount of like forgiving them for being human, but also realizing like the dangers of, of getting too close to an interview subject. It's happened to me as well. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, as, as we wrap up here, I, one, I want to thank you for your insights um, and your perspective and your and your stories. Um, but two, I also want to give you an opportunity. It's such a, an interesting and unique time in storytelling. More and more platforms popping up with a lot of the conversations here at Sterable are about what's next on the, on the uh, horizon for each of you as a storyteller. And Sarah, I'll start with you. Oh, I'm sorry. What was it? What's next for me as a storyteller? Yeah, what's next for you as a storyteller? And what, what, you know, how are you sort of using this time to, I don't know, pivot or maybe even reapproach how you're able to tell the stories you are? That's a really good question. Um, I, cause, because I don't go anywhere anymore, I've been writing a lot more. <laughs> um, and uh, so writing has really been uh, a deep, sort of development for me during COVID. But um, I've been so busy since the lockdown and because both of my films are uh, very much like 80% archive. So I've just been watching a lot of footage and working more than I've ever worked. Um, And using, again, using this time to really think about how this historical moment is affecting many different aspects of our lives and how it's going to affect, you know, future business and storytelling, how we approach content, um, you know, where we need to live in order to, like, I don't know if anyone's going to break into Hollywood anymore because people are just able to do it on TikTok now. Um, so I, I think that the industry's shifting, and, and I think that's a good thing. I think that we that it's time for things to evolve. And maybe, you know, the center of the industry doesn't need to be in Hollywood. Maybe it can be more global, and it can be more through through the Internet. And I think that's cool. Well said. Well said. Q, what's next for you? I know you guys got more episodes of the pod coming, but any other kind of platforms or avenues you're looking to play in in terms of storytelling? Uh, man, just just the whole thing. We're trying to expand this whole knuckleheads thing into more of a network where we can, you know, go across the board and do different things, whether it's in TV, film. I'm a, I got a book that I just pretty much complete that I'm going to release at some point in the near future. Uh and as well, we're trying to work on the uh, the the, the um, my, myself and Darius's story. So, whichever way we're gonna try and do that, we got we got some exciting, cool things coming, especially on the pod. And then we got some. The next guest is gonna be real, real nice. Well, it's just so cool, man. You just put it out there, and good things come back to you, and and, and well deserves. And Sean, lastly, with you in terms of nonfiction storytelling, what's next on the horizon? Yeah, yeah, I've been working on a doc that's taken a couple years, but it's it's with the COVID, it's allowed a deeper dive. So excited about this the story of this, uh, this Texas football hero who, who lost his leg to cancer, and and later in his death inspired the National Cancer Act and, and moved cancer research forward. Um, and now he's up for, for sainthood, which is a, a unique path to like understand what it means to be a saint. So I've enjoyed the journey with that one and hoping to get, you know, back into production. I know people are reimagining production now. So trying to understand how that's going to work. I know Sarah's mentioned, you know, doing Zoom can be as productive as being in person for interviews. So looking towards the end of this year, hopefully if there's, you know, more if safety is not as much of an issue to make things happen and, and get that going and and uh, and yeah working with you on uh, some other bullshit. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> uh, two of us trying to get back. One last run in our own playing careers, you know. I got one mm-hmm. left to prove still on the court. I know Quentin said goodbye to the game. I still have something left to give. Uh, Sarah, thank you so much for spending. Thank some you time. for having me. This is a cool conversation. Thank you guys. Yeah, this was yeah. you guys were inspiring today. Thank you so much. Sean and Quentin Richardson. That's a wild pairing in my life. Thank you both for uh, for (laughs) sharing. Thank you, Ajay, for putting this all together. Again, we'd like to thank our festival sponsors here at Sterable, including Dell Technologies, AMC Networks, Shutterstock, and Adorama. Also, special thanks to Writer Duet, a real-time collaborative professional, ridiculously fun and easy-to-use screenwriting software for creators. 
And thank you to all of you guys out there in the audience for taking some time during your festival and during your week for listening to our stories and our conversation. Uh, we love seeing you here. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next time. The next session is this evening. Uh, six o'clock Eastern, Starable's Career Achievement Award is presented to Katja Blitchfield, co-creator of HBO's High Maintenance, uh, WGA award-winning writer, Emmy-winning casting director for 30 Rock, one of my favorite shows. Um, thanks for joining us. Have a great, great rest of your week, everybody. Great rest of your terrible fest. And make sure you download, subscribe, and listen to the Knuckleheads podcast. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Bye, guys. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye.